This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. So, welcome. Um, it's, uh, it's, an, it's an honor for the American Numismatic Society to welcome you and our uh, honored guests. Um, I think there are very few members of the NS in the room, so I may say in few words what we are. In ANS, S doesn't stand for secret, first of all. Uh, we're not a secret society, even though being in the street and seeing the building and going to the 11 floors is a lot of yeah. steps and layers. So it's not very obvious that about 650 or maybe 700,000 objects uh, of all kind, mostly coins, but as well in God's banknotes, um, African uh, proto money and all the type uh, of uh, objects are here. We are not a museum. We are not a publishing company. We are not a research center. We are not a public facility, but we are a little bit of everything. And uh, the society was created in 1858. So we, we are at 164 years of existence, more or less. I think we are the second oldest um, learned society in, uh, in New York City. And um, before I introduce the, the speakers, um, I think I can do this. Does it work? Yes. So our motto, uh, you saw in, in, in Latin, uh, parvane perient, means that the small things don't perish. So I'd, I'd like, with these two slides, before we move to the core of the topic on the euro, um, first of all, to acknowledge our very dear colleagues from the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., who have put together an exhibition on really big money. And these uh, type of uh, yap money can be extremely big. They're taller than a human being. So, oh. yes, they're taller than a human, than a human being. So they, it's pretty big money which means that money is not always small. The next slide, please, and that will be my last slide. So you recognize some people from the audience uh, here. They're carrying what's possibly our heaviest uh, currency. This is the copper plaque uh, from Sweden, 17th century. It's probably about 10, 15 kilo. I forgot the exact way, but it's, um, it's significantly um, uh, heavy, I would say. And um, I wonder, before introducing the talk for today, if the reason why the Swiss didn't join the euro was because that type of heavy money could not be handled by the <laughs> euro system. So today, we welcome um, two speakers from two of the main, or probably the main central banks in the world, the uh, Reserve Federal System, and uh, the Bundesbank, which is part of the uh, European Central Bank system. I put my glasses, getting older. So, <laughs> Professor Dr. Johannes Berman is a member of the executive board of the Deutsche Bundesbank. Professor Dr. Berman was born in 1960 in Emstetten, Westphalia, Germany. He studied law at the Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich after passing his second state examination in law in 88, he joined the staff of the Federal Ministry of Youth, Family Affairs, Women and Health. In 1990, he completed his PhD in law at the University of Münster and then worked at the Saxon State Ministry for Social Affairs and the Saxon State Chancellery until 1992. From 92 to 95, he held the, he held the position of head of office for the CDU Secretary General Peter Inse, and then became state councillor to the Senator of Finance of the Free Anseatic City of Bremen, 95-99. From 99 to 2003, Professor Dr. Berman was Secretary of State for Federal and European Affairs at the Hessian State Chancellery and Commissioner of the State of Essen to the Federation, the German Federation. After that, he worked in law firm as a lawyer in 08. He was appointed chief of the state chancellery and minister of state for federal and European affairs of the free state of Saxony and was then reappointed to these positions 
in 09 until 2014. Since January 2015, Professor Berman has been a member of the executive board of the Deutsche Bundesbank, responsible for the Directorate's banknotes, controlling administration, construction, and the procurement center. Our second guest and speaker today is Mark Gould from the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, where he is the chief payment executive. Mark Gould um, is the Federal Reserve System chief payment executive. He's responsible for leading the full range of payment services provided by the Federal Reserve Financial Services, working to deliver a fully integrated suite of payment services and a united customer experience for financial institutions nationwide. Gould previously served as the Chief Operating Officer and first Vice President of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. He led the Federal Reserve System Cash Product Office, which oversees the processing, quality, and distribution of U.S. currency domestically and internationally. Gould's career at the Federal Reserve Bank began 30 years ago. I don't believe that. I'm sorry. <laughs> in the retail payment division of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. Prior to his role as Chief Operating Officer and first Vice President and National Cash Product Director, Gould led, led the Seattle branch of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco and provided leadership to technology, operations, and administrative functions. So without further ado, Professor Berman. Thank you very much for all the kind introduction and that you remember me that I'm an old man because when we always saw what I did in the past and I fall a little bit asleep as it is in my age and I have more than five minutes time. Uh, thank you very much Dr. Brentburg, uh, Dr. Wartenberg Kagan, dear Mark, ladies and gentlemen, it's wonderful to be here and I'm deeply impressed um, that such a wonderful collection in the midst of New York City and you know it's really really amazing we saw and all the best to you and to the collection <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen um before we get into what i hope will be an exciting panel discussion with mark Gold, let me give you a brief introduction to the work money can't buy happiness as the saying goes, it may come at a surprise to you that, that science sees this completely different. The prospect of holding cash in one's hand has been proven to cause the brain to release dopamine, the feel-good hormone, also associated with eating, drinking, or taking drugs or any other wonderful things that flood our brain. Even more, it appears electronic payment media don't have this rewarding effect. The way digital payments are processed in the brain is far more complex and has absolutely nothing to do with dopamine. As numismatists who deal with money and its physical form, this fact should certainly please you. And I was not aware of the happiness giving effect of money until just recently when I read the, when I read the book, uh, well, the, the business psychologist, Julia Pitters. It's uh, the last part in the book, and she is writing about this effect, the dopamine effect. Um, she contributed one of a total of 33 articles through the collection, which we are going to present Mark here today. Personally, I like another insight from her as even more. Ilya Pitas finds that our common European cash can also be said to have an identity creating factor. Using euro notes and coins allows people to identify more strongly with the Euro area, with the European area. Euro cash has become perhaps the most tangible symbol 
of a united Europe. And now I have to switch to slide two. Oh, I hope there's slide one over there. Oh, thanks, Mark. Good. No? That's it. That's the right one. Today, ladies and gentlemen, over 340 million Europeans use the euro to make payments. Next year, Croatia will become the 20th country to join the euro area. 20 years ago, when euro cash was introduced, people were rather skeptical, especially in Germany. Many people were unfamiliar with the new currency and looked back on the trusted Deutschmarks with real nostalgia. In the early days of the single currency, the euro was often unjustly accused of having made prices more expenses, expensive. The Germans have even coined a term for this Teuro. There are a lot of people that understand German. It's, uh, the, well, it's uh, the combination of teuer, which means expensive, and euro, which is the euro. So they said it's Teuro. The euro is a Teuro. The German word was not very charming at that time. Criticism also came from the academia when the euro was introduced. The celebrated economist Milton Friedman, he is US, right? Now. So the celebrated economist Milton Friedman wrote a letter to Ottmar Issing. We can read it in the book as well, then chief economist at the European Central Bank in which he, Milton Friedman, predicted that the euro area would break apart within how many years? Do you remember? Within three years. Um, well, as we all know now, and as a matter of fact, the statement did not come true, but admittedly, the euro has already experienced difficult times in its young history. I would remind you or the financial and sovereign debt crisis right now, like other currencies, the euro is currently being challenged by unusually high inflation and high inflation rates and war and what is all going on all over the world. For the vast majority of its existence, however, the euro has lived up to its promise of stability. Overall, the euro has proved to be a successful and stable currency, bringing people in Europe closer together. Young Europeans today can't even remember the days of national currencies, and even today, when I see a Deutschmark or a Deutschmark banknote, it looks so strange. It looks like I cannot imagine that we paid by that, and it was so familiar 20 years ago. But now, we all are used to the euro. The commemorative publication presented her here today offers a deep dive into our money and its future as viewed from various perspectives. So it's only the euro on the front, and that's 20 years of euro, is a sort of to think about what is money all over the world. And that's why I'm so thankful, Mark, that you are with us. Well, that's the wrong one. Next one. <laughs> oh, that's referring because, well, the good thing is I'm here. I arrived in New York City, but my luggage did not. <laughs> and maybe there was one of those skills that went over. Um, well, planning the book, ladies and gentlemen. When we started planning and designing the book, the German economy was in the midst of a pandemic lockdown. So we were all hanging around and thinking, what can we do? There was a great deal of uncertainty. And as we often observe in times of crisis, demand for cash skyrocketed. At the same time, the narrative that cash will lose its importance in the era of digital transformation gained more and more momentum. This is true that the use of contactless payment methods starting from a very low level in 2020 
has become significantly more widespread in recent years. However, the results of our study on payment behavior in Germany, which was published only three months ago, also show that cash is still by far the most frequently used means of payments for everyday purchases at our local store. Last year, nearly 60% of all payments at the point of sale were made in cash last year in the midst of the pandemic. While debit card payments came in a distant second accounting for just over 22% of payments. The facts are different in other countries, as we know from our book um, that we wrote down. The share of cash payments varies considerably among countries, even within the euro area. For example, in the US, the number of monthly cash payments by consumers decreased from around, if I am right, 14 in 2016 to 7 in 2021. In turn, however, the importance of cash as a store of value has expanded. Between 2016 and 2021, the per capita amount of cash kept at home as a store of value increased from around 173 US dollar to 347 US dollar in October 2021, October 2021. In any case, there is a significant proportion of people who remain loyal to cash, while others may consider electronic means of payment to be more in keeping with the time. This divide is also reflected in public opinion about cash. On one side of the spectrum, there is a time stock of cash as a curse of a technology of a bygone age. As the other extreme, there are some who believe that we are heading knowingly towards a cashless society and thus entering a world devoid of privacy and devoid of data protection. Of course, books on polarizing topics need to exaggerate in one direction or the other. When it comes to the multifaceted question of the future of our money, though, I don't think it's particularly helpful to see things only black or only white. And I think that's the advantage of this book. The main trust of this book is to engage precisely with this often impassioned debate on the future of our money by presenting and appreciating different viewpoints in objective and balanced manner. So you have several um, articles about the digital euro from every point how you can describe it. There are people that are a little bit more skeptic and the others say, oh, we want to have it, all the, um, uh, the digital central banks money. We achieve this by considering the various aspects of money and currency from all manner of angles in the hope that the results, the resulting inside yield, a particularly nuanced and at times even surprising new overview. A conscious decision was made to cover a broad range of topics from the history of money in Europe uh, to the symbolism and special importance of currency in the context of German monetary union and ultimately of European integration all the way through the money of tomorrow in an era of digital transformation. These are illuminated from an economic, philosophical, sociological or as heard at the beginning psychological perspective i am very very grateful to each and every one of this book's truly renowned authors for their enlightening contributions the end result is i believe a unique compendium containing 33 individual perspectives from all over the world the contributions to the book are divided into three parts. The first covers money and currency in Europe. These contributions shed light on aspects of European integration, put the role of cash into an economic and legal context and explore the history of money. The first one that's very, very amazing of Ati Haikonen, who is the sort of a Pope in cash is very interesting. Trust in fiat money 
auntie describes what the means of money is, where does it come from? That the Swedish people were the first who invented it in the 17th century. And uh, that's really interesting to see where it comes from. The second part of the book focuses on the special significance of national central banks in supplying cash to the domestic economy. We start by looking at Germany and the Bundesbank's prominent role in Germany's cash cycle. We then broaden our horizons beyond the euro area and embark on a journey through the world's large industrial nations and emerging markets economy around the world. It's marked all our colleagues from China, uh, from Canada, from Australia, from New Zealand that point out on a cash and on a money perspective, uh, how money is running around in their countries. And there you get an idea what money is all around the world. And I think that's at the moment the most valuable. Uh, our Chinese colleague just wrote me a letter last week um, because he gave the book to the governor of the People's Bank of China. And the governor then addressed me and said, oh, it's such an interesting book. I want to have some more. So it's, well, it's a, it's a real compendium where you can see from all over the world what means of money, especially cash, cash is. <clears throat> National central banks from major G7 countries explore three key issues from a home country perspective. First, how does each central bank ensure an adequate supply of cash to the economy? Second, how important do central banks assess cash as being for the domestic economy? And third, what role could cash carve out for itself in the digital area? And then we have a survey uh, all over the world about these three points. What is striking the here is that many of these countries have undergone similar developments and are facing comparable challenges with respect to their cash cycle. However, differences, national particularities are also visible in the book, not least across continents and cultures. What all G20 central banks have in common, ladies and gentlemen, are the new challenges they will face as payments go increasingly digital. But each country's cash cycle is different, meaning that the question as to the future of money requires individual and country-specific responses. Particular attention is devoted to this forward-looking perspective in the book's third part through the interdisciplinary tense of economics, philosophy, sociology, and psychology, thoughts on the role of cash as well as the money of tomorrow are raised and discussed in depth. One strong focus here is on the importance of digital forms of money, CBDC, up to and including central banks, digital currencies. Ladies and gentlemen, in marking the 20th anniversary of the introduction of Euro banknotes and Euro coins, we wanted to take the opportunity not only to look back, but also to cast our eyes to the future. This forward looking perspective runs through the book like a common thread. Who in the future can tell us what money is? We've seen it today, how different money was in centuries ago, but what is money in future? Of course, no definitive answers can be given in the midst of a process of economic and also potential uh, societal transition triggered not least by the pandemic. Be that as it may. One lesson from his story contained in the book is that the basic idea of money endures. Money needs to be readily available generally accepted and above all stable in value, ladies and gentlemen, stable in value. This is more important than ever in the current environment. Money is based on trust. That is what underpins our money economy today and will do so tomorrow as well. Thank you for your attention. Okay, great. It's, uh...
see if I can advance the slides to see. Oh, there we go. Uh, okay, well, good afternoon. Uh, it's great to be here in New York City, and um, I'd like to thank the American Numismatic Society for the opportunity to be here today. I uh, uh, had a, a, a short tour in the vault before this talk, and I have to say I felt like a kid in a candy store um, as someone who's really interested in currency and coin, being able to see uh, different generations of what uh, of what money really really looks like uh, it was a terrific opportunity. Um, I uh, I live in San Francisco and in San Francisco, if I spend time in uh, Silicon Valley, I'm getting a little feedback. I'm not sure if there's somebody. Uh, there we go. Um, uh, uh, and in San Francisco, when I talk with people in Silicon Valley and I tell them what I do, I, I manage payments and I manage cash. They say, well, cash, I thought we stopped using cash 20 years ago. And, uh, and I say, well, no, actually, that's not quite true. In fact, there's never been more US currency in circulation um, uh, as there is today. The, the total amount, uh, total dollar value of US currency in circulation has doubled in the last 10 years. Uh, and it's never gone down. It just continues to rise. And so what I'd like to talk a little bit about today is so what's what's happening? What are we seeing? And maybe just a little bit of a glimmer of, of the future. Um, and then happy to take uh, uh, questions uh, that you might have. I'll just maybe start with a word about the Federal Reserve System, um, because the, the Federal Reserve System, I, I used to think was one of the most um, misunderstood organizations uh, in the country. I now think that the ANS might be the most misunderstood organization in the country from your introduction to being a secret society. Uh, but the, the Fed has a number of roles uh, performing monetary policy, ensuring the stability of the, the US banking system. And, and third and most importantly, providing financial services to, uh, to banks of all shapes and sizes across the United States. There are about 10,000 banks across the United States uh, providing payment services and distributing currency and coin uh, to the population. In order to do that, uh, we have 28 operating locations around the country um, so that are basically performing uh, processing of, uh, of currency, ensuring the fitness and authentic authenticity of uh, currency in circulation, um, and, uh, uh, and generally ensuring that we have sufficient inventories to meet demand. Our largest facility is actually just across the river from New York City here uh, in East Rutherford, uh, New Jersey. Um, we have about 1,200 people that, uh, that, that perform that function around the country. Um, so the U.S. dollar has been the, 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 the global uh, uh, dominant global reserve currency for, for many years, for, you know, about uh, almost 240 years now that the U.S. dollar has been in circulation. It's, it's the, the primary denomination for, for global commerce. Um, and, uh, and as a result, um, there's over $2 trillion uh, worth of uh, U.S. currency in circulation. Um, what we can see in this, this first slide is, is the, how the use of U.S. currency has been changing, and actually all currency, just varying uh, a bit by country. Um, so what you can see is that the, 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 the use of currency for transactional purposes, going to a store and buying something with currency, that, that use has been going down. And that, that reduction was particularly pronounced during the, the pandemic. Um, that we've recently hopefully um, uh, exited. Um, yeah, the reasons for that are, are probably obvious and each of you probably have your own stories about that. I know I have mine. I did my first online grocery shopping during the pandemic and, uh, and you know, the rise of uh, more online shopping um, obviously, uh, you know, makes uh, the use of currency um, a little less uh, frequent. I, I took an Uber uh, from my hotel over to this location this morning. And when you, you ride an Uber, you, you do other transactions in an app, you, you, the, the, the process of, of using the service has a payment embedded. The payment is almost in, invisible. You're not making a separate purchasing and payment decision. And, and so that's really what's behind these, uh, these numbers. So, uh, so who's using cash and why does cash still matter? Well, as you see in this slide, you know, we, what we can see, you know, is that it's uh, unbanked individuals in particular, and by unbanked, you think of think of households, individuals, families um, who lack access to either a bank bank account or the full range of financial services that uh, that that many other people um, have 
access to. And it could be for a variety of reasons. It could be because um, they're at the low end of the income distribution, and so they may not have sufficient resources to, uh, to open a bank account. It may be that they don't trust the financial institu uh, the, the, the financial community or the financial industry. They don't trust banks. Um, it could be a, a, for a variety of things. It could be maybe for out of concerns for privacy, um, knowing that that uh, that other payment types uh, you know might track their their behavior. So what you can see is that the uh, and it's a little hard to read, but the rate of transactions using cash for the unbanked is about three times. Uh, the rate of transactions uh, for uh, individuals who have uh, a bank account. And that's important because the unbanked population, maybe unsurprisingly, uh, tends to be those households at the lower end of the income distribution. Um, so without access to cash, without uh, you know, being included in the financial system, those individuals and families might actually be restricted in terms of what they can, uh, what they can do, what they can buy, um, how they can uh, conduct commerce, just basically provide uh, for providing for their families. So cash is important. It's important to um, not just to uh, unbanked individuals, it's important to, to everyone. And we, we know that because we can look at the statistics and see um, currency and circulation continuing to rise, both in absolute and relative terms. And I'll, I'll walk through just a, a little bit of this uh, slide. So um, what you can see on the, uh, let's see, on the blue line is the, the rise in currency and circulation of our high denomination notes, 50s and 100s. Um, these are the notes that are distributed really widely, both domestically and globally. We call these the store of value notes because they tend to be used a little bit less frequently in transactions, going to the grocery store, buying a cup of coffee, than they do, you know, with of people really, you know, wanting to hold their value, having it as a stable, secure store of value. Um, and we can see that this, this chart covers roughly the past century. Um, you can see that the value of these notes in circulation has risen very steadily, sometimes dramatically. There's a few interesting you know, points on this slide you know, you, uh, around Y2K when people uh, were worried. Remember, for those of you who are around, do you remember all the fears of, that the, everything with the global financial system would fall apart, and planes would fall out of the sky, people would be trapped in elevators? None of those things actually happen. Um, but people panicked and they took a lot of money out of banks and financial institutions and then, and then you can see the spike went back down. At the same time, the, the value of our transactional denominations, so those are the, the ones, you know, twos, fives, tens, and twenties, the, the value of those denominations, again, relative to the growth in GDP over time, has been trending downwards. And that, that just you know, really confirms that what, the, what you see in this slide is the total value of U.S. currency going up very steadily, sometimes dramatically over time. Um, but uh, uh, the, the transactional use case uh, is declining and, uh, you know, in line with uh, what, I, what I spoke about earlier. Now, because we're here to talk uh, partly uh, about the euro and celebrating, um, congratulations, celebrating the launch uh, of, of, your, of this book, um, I thought I might just spend a few minutes talking about the, the euro and the dollar. So I thought it might be interesting to look at what happened with the dollar at the period of time um, that the euro was introduced, um, because that was a that was a new uh, a new phenomenon on the global stage, and and I think a question would be a natural question might be if the dollar is the the world's reserve currency, what effect might it have on the dollar when the euro is introduced? And it's actually really interesting when you you actually look at what uh, happens in the uh, in the shaded area. Um, you can see as the 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 value and circulation of the euro is growing relatively rapidly after its launch. The, there's a flattening of growth in uh, value and circulation of US $100 notes. And so clearly there was a, you know, I, I think it's reasonable to infer that there was a little bit of a substitution effect uh, around the world as people you know, started to, uh, to uh, uh, demand and hold, uh, hold the euro. Um, and then since then, the, you can see the trajectory of demand for the two currencies, you know, maybe a little bit like a roller coaster, um, but, uh, but you can see that they've, they've really tracked uh, one another um, you know, relatively closely. One other thing that you notice in this chart is demand tends to spike when 
bad things happen. Bad things can be natural disasters, they can be geopolitical events, they can be uh, a particular country falling into some kind of you know, economic crisis. When that happens, um, and individuals look at their, their total amount of assets that they have as a family, um, they generally are gonna wanna put that value into something that's stable. You talked about trust, something that's trusted and stable that they feel they're still going to retain the value of their their savings, you know, for the next week, the next month, uh, and into the next year. So, um, so finally, I, I get asked a lot, particularly um, as I said, living in San Francisco. So, aren't we just you know one new payment innovation away from cash becoming a dinosaur, and uh, and so I, I asked my team to look into this because I always like to look at history. That's what I love about this vault. You can literally walk back thousands of years and see how what money look, looked like, um, you know, thousands of years ago. But if you actually look at history and you see how the number of payment alternatives has increased, you can see the rise of of debit cards, of credit cards, of ACH, dramatic growth in ACH, electronic payments. Um, and even the rise of private digital currencies and, and increasingly, you know, a new way of making payments person to person, uh, you know, real time. So what's happened through all of that? Well, two things that I think are noteworthy. One uh, is that the total value of U.S. currency and circulation has grown up, has continued to grow throughout all of this innovation. Um, uh, there's not a single one of these innovations that's led to a decline in U.S. currency in the last century. I think that's kind of interesting. The second thing, though, that, that is shown on the chart is you can see a decline in the billions of $1 notes in circulation. So why is that important? Well, you know, $1 notes, they tend to be, you know, primarily used in uh, transactions and in change, you know, so if you buy a cup of coffee for, you know, for $4, or I guess $7 here in New York, um, uh, you get, uh, you, uh, you, you uh, get $3 and change from a $10 bill. And so you can see that the circulation patterns of $1 notes, you know, is highly correlated to transactional use of, of currency. And so exactly what you see, this, this chart is a perfect picture of what, what we see in the statistics is the that US currency in circulation rising steadily over time, uh, sometimes more than others, but you know, low to mid single digits, you know, double digits during the pandemic, uh, but very stable over time. But the transactional use of currency is definitely um, is definitely declining as the number of uh, payment types uh, um, uh, continue to, to diversify. So, you know, I think just in summary, the, the US dollar has just been a really stable, secure source of strength and stability in the US and around the world uh, for our almost 240 years. Um, and I think increasingly, it, what's really important about that, it, it offers a safe haven. It's a safe haven for people to store their value when there's concern that their local currency you know, around in various countries around the world that may be dealing with instability um, might be uh, might be less stable. And so it's a, a means of, of, of retaining value over time. Um, you know, as other countries there and there are several examples of this around the world as other countries may start to reduce uh, the importance of the role of cash, maybe even discourage uh, consumers from holding cash. Um, my you know prediction and this is you know my my opinion not necessarily shared by anyone else in the federal reserve system but my my view is that you know consumers will probably still seek out something that they can hold there's some you know something from you know there's really something to a tangible store of value something that you can hold you can you can look at and you can uh, you you can trust that it's uh, safe and secure and to the extent that individuals are looking for that type of thing I believe they're going to turn to the dollar and to the euro, and I think that the dollar and the euro will continue to uh, to, to enjoy that role of uh, reserve currency uh, for many years to come. I think it's it might be worth noting at the Federal Reserve, you know, right now we're really engaged in two big projects related to payments. You know, one is to design and build and introduce a new way of making payments instantly. It's called FedNow. It's coming to market next year. It'll enable anyone to pay 
anyone anywhere instantly you know when it comes uh, to market um, and we're really excited about it it's the first new payment rail we've introduced in over 40 years at the same time we're also investing in cash we're investing in the capacity and the resilience of our currency processing and distribution infrastructure uh, because what we experienced during the pandemic is that when geopolitical or social crises happen, we need to be there with sufficient US currency uh, to meet demand, recognizing that sometimes demand uh, peaks even more highly than, uh, than, than uh, you may have ever experienced previously in history. Um, and so with that, I would love to get to whatever questions uh, that you might have. And, and again, uh, very much appreciate the opportunity to, to be here today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. This one. Sorry. Th thank you very much. So we're going to have a, now a Q and A sessions where we will turn to the audience and uh, ask um, our speakers. Um, what we may have in mind. Um, I, may, I, I think it's very uh, fashionable that the moderator is the first one to ask a question. <laughs> it, 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 it puts everybody at ease and then, you know, I know at the end there will be scores of questions and we, can't, we won't be able to take everyone. So the, my first question, besides thinking that San Francisco is a more expensive place than New York, so I'm, <laughs> no. not, sure, I, I'm not sure about the price of this cup of coffee in San Francisco, but I was struck reading uh, Mr. Berman's chapter, but that, that question could go to both of you. Um, a transaction, so that's page 199, a cash payment cost 24 cents, a transaction in cash, and a credit card payment cost a euro. And it's something we all experience. You go to a retailer, you pay by credit card, and if you know the retailer pretty well, he or she will tell you, do you don't mind using cash? Because I'm charged 5% or 4% by Amex or by Visa or by MasterCard or either network. When you're paying something online, um, often you, know, you, you give money to a charity, to your school, your kid's school or something. They say, oh, we charge a convenience fee of 5% because of the credit card. But effectively, that means that the cash is subsidized. If it's cheaper, it's because an entire system behind print transport and make that ca cash available to us and change the banknotes when they are too old. So how are you seeing this function of central banks and the banking system and the reason why cash is cheaper than electronic payment and should it stay this way? And should the public, because you are the public, keep subsidizing uh, cash? Well, I'm happy to start. Um, so, uh, so I, I keep track of how many times I go to a retailer uh, or a store of some sort and they say, I, I, I ask if they take cash or cards and they say, well, I take cards, but I'd prefer cash. Um, and, and so I think the phenomenon that you're talking about is quite, uh, is quite common. I'd like to just maybe spend a minute talking about the economics of, of cash. So, so yes, it's, I mean, it's true. We do not charge for currency services. We provide them freely to uh, financial institutions. Part of the reason why is, is I, I think I, I referenced in my talk is we really believe that every American should have access to the financial system, whatever that looks like. And for some people, access to cash is their only tie to the financial system so we believe that's a that's a social good um, that's uh, that's worth investing in now i will also tell you as a central bank um, uh, when we sell a 100 dollars bill to you um, we sell it to to your bank and then they give it to you but we sell it to your bank for a hundred dollars does not cost $100 to make a $100 bill. Uh, it costs roughly 15 cents to make a, a $100 bill. And so we, uh, we make and distribute, distribute a lot 
of $100 bills uh, that don't cost $100 to make. And so the, the amount by which uh, it's being subsidized might be something a lot less than what you're assuming, uh, because the Federal Reserve at the end of the day finances all of its operations out of the, the various revenue sources of revenue that we get and then returns everything back to the to the US Treasury. And that amount varies every year based on what interest rates are. It, it's been between you know, 40 and 80, 90 billion dollars a, a, a year. So um, that's how I would, I would respond and invite your, your views. Yeah, um, well, everything is said. But what I want to point out is that money, and that's what this book is around, the future of our money. Um, if you try to get a picture of money in your head when somebody says money, it's cash. It's not a credit card. It's not a digital, digital euro or, or whatever. So what I mean is that as a uh, an economy, a worldwide economy, it is necessary to run a sort of blood circulation. And that's the money and the cash on the other hand, or meaningly. And that's our task as central banks. That's public behavior. It's a public act to make or to let the economy, um, well, not, not even elaborate, but, but to, to, to look how the blood through the economy runs. And that's why we print the banknotes, because nothing for the consumer. We distribute it mostly to the first or the second branch, depends on how we are organized. We make the development of, uh, of banknotes, for example, all the security meanings, you know, that uh, it's not that easy to, to, to copy banknotes. And that all costs a lot of money. And if you go, for example, into, um, into non-cash circulations, credit cards that are all private organizations, that are banks that organize it. And they give a service. And it's not a public service. Mark and me, we are doing a public service. Um, but you don't pay for, for the policeman or the policewoman as well. So um, what they are doing is a very good service. And of course, they want to make money with that service. And, you know, it's, it's not an ideological uh, neither or nor or the either or the other. You know, every one of us uses cash in one means and cashless payments in other means. So I think it's only fair that uh, we concentrate as uh, public banks, as central banks, on the real means of payments, and that's cash. <clears throat> well, interesting. Uh, well, interesting. Uh, what question you refer to that Fed now is something which is uh, is that linked to the initiative of the digital dollar, which also I know the Fed is working on for one. Yeah, uh, great. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, it, no, it's not. It, it's a. It's a. Uh, there's you know some I would say basic foundational research being done you know, on what a central bank digital currency in the United States might look like. But that's, you know, there's policy research, there's technology research, there's, you know, kind of experimental uh, work, you know, happening to just understand what the implications might be from a, again, from a policy and, and, uh, um, and technology perspective and how it might fit into our portfolio of services. But no decision has been made about that. And, and so you can really think of that as kind of, you know, like I said, foundational, you know, background research. The work that we're doing on instant payments is is real, and there is a product coming to market next year. And it's the, the way that you might you might think about it. It's you know, moving um, money digitally versus moving a, a, a digital asset. And so, a central, you know, digital currencies, whether they're private or public, you know, it's a digital asset. It, it's you know, being uh, you're literally moving, you know, an asset, you know, from one person to another, just like I be moving a banknote from one person uh, to another. A digital balance, moving a digital balance is something that happens today quite frequently. It's how all of us uh, wind up likely getting paid. We get a you know an, an electronic uh, deposit into our account every couple of weeks. We maybe make our house payment or our insurance payment or other your rent payment, you know, whatever, you know, once a month. Um, that all happens electronically also. That's, that's moving money digitally, but it's not moving a digital asset. 
I mean, easily more than 90% of the value of, of uh, financial transactions that happen, say, like down on Wall Street. And those are all digital, moving di money digitally, um, but it's different than, than, than what's envisioned with a, a digital currency. That's actually one of the big questions that we're, we're grappling with and that I think all central banks are grappling with is in a world where you have the ability to move money instantly between people and businesses, what is the use case for a central bank issued digital currency? What are the things that are not possible using an instant payment solution, particularly if you get to a point where it's connected across borders? Um, that, that, I think that's one of the research questions that we're really focused on understanding the answer to. Um, and uh, but in the meantime, you know, we see instant payments as uh, as a, a significant importance uh, to the financial system, you know, uh, um, by itself. Partly because um, financial transactions today um, generally take a little longer um, than most people might even realize. Even if a tool that they're using, like an app on their phone, it might give them the illusion that the payment is happening instantly, but in the background, it's really not. It's happening overnight or maybe over a couple of days. Yeah, maybe I, I cash that up. There are a lot of open questions. For example, is going to run the accounts where the digital currency is distributed from? Are these the central banks? We just talked about that uh, cash, which is produced by the central banks, is uh, free of charge at anything. And what does that mean for the financial industry? Or on the other side, you remember the figure number five, the early 20s growth in US correspondence with slower growth in uh, US $100 notes that we saw before, where the euro came up. That's why we now start a sort of uh, discussion on CBDC, the digital euro, in, uh, in Europe, we try to make a decision or to prepare a decision until 2025. Because as we remember, until 2002, uh, the US dollar was a sort of unicorn worldwide because there was nothing that was going on. And uh, then the euro came up, when I have to remember the slide, and it stopped in 2015, Mark, when I joined the central bank. Mm. So. Um, that's, was that was that's, that a correlation? Uh, was that a? I'm not quite sure. I'm just mm, just just okay. try to try to figure it out. Uh, and now we make a new attempt with the CBDC to look whether it's a chance for the euro to come up as a digital currency, um, because uh, most of the cashless payments, well, credit cards, ninety percent, ninety five percent. Uh, all the credit cards all over the world are from U.S. American banks or something like that. So what we try is a little bit, well, as always, Europe works a little bit that Rubik's Cube. You know, you turn right, you turn left, and at the end of the day, nobody knows why you have a couple of different, different colors on different sides. Uh, and that's the new attempt that we are going to do. Um, first of all, just thank you both so much for all the knowledge and nuance and complexity you bring to these issues. Um, I was just wondering, because I know this was sort of uh, in the ether when, you know, President Biden was considering uh, rejigging and replacing uh, Chairman Powell at the, uh, at the Fed, but, uh, and also understanding that different central banks have different mandates, but do you see a role for central banks to steer investment towards uh, more, more sustainable investments um, and uh, with an eye towards, you know, the few, especially in terms of uh, sustainable in terms of climate policy. I know that was uh, discussed a bit um, and I don't know how that might change between the Boomers Bank and the US Fed, but I was curious if that's something that y'all discuss. You want to start? Yeah, I, I start now. Um, it's a little bit like, like Waldorf and Stettler of, of the central banks. <laughs> um, we have a certain public task as central banks that means financial stability. That's our mandate. And we have to stick to that mandate because we are independent. That means our independence um, refers to the precise mandate that we have. And as long as nobody tells us 
to take up a political mandate in a way of sustainability. We are not working in it in a special, direct way. That's the first part of my answer, but that's a very serious part. The second thing is that, of course, what we are going to do within our mandate on financial stability is to look how sustainability influence the financial markets. So what we do is look into a sort of mirror, an economic mirror, what sustainability means. And that's very, very difficult. Uh, at the moment, I read about the discussions between different states in the US where they are going to invest their money or where they're not going to invest their money. But that's our task. But we are not politicians. We are independent central banks and we only look on financial stability. Yeah, I, I agree with that completely. And I might, um, so you might actually see research being done by various Federal Reserves, you know, on climate risk or things like that. And, and then you, you think, well, how does that square with the answer that Johannes just gave you? Well, I mean, it, it really fits with um, you thinking about risk and thinking about the future risk to the financial system. So, for example, Historically, we our, our bank regulators and supervisors would always look at the portfolios of financial institutions to see, okay, are you overly concentrated in a particular sector? Maybe that might raise the risk to the financial institution if that sector went into a downturn. So maybe they're overly, um, I mean, a bank, for example, during the global financial crisis that was overexposed to real estate, um, didn't perform very well and might have might have uh, might have yeah. failed. And so, you know, our supervision and regulation folks are always looking to the future and saying, what are those future risks that might exist um, that would threaten the stability of the financial system? And then start to assess, you know, how to to think about that uh, in the supervision and regulation of, uh, of banks. So it's in that vein that the, the that that work is happening less trying to influence you know what decisions that a particular bank or business might make that's really not not part of the central bank's mandate um, but it, it but it's certainly something that the you know various uh, uh, you know, national governments could could think about in terms of incenting certain uh, investments or behaviors very clear, but you work in the real world and there are political and psychological factors that definitely influence your decisions. I mean, this whole you know front page news for the last six months on interest rates is a perfect example. So can you explain a little bit about the psychology and the political aspects of your job? <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm, I'm happy to start, and I'll um, let me emphasize these are my views and not anyone else in the Federal Reserve System. I actually have kind of a unique perspective on this because while my day-to-day -day job doesn't involve anything related to interest rates, my day-to-day -day <laughs> job, and ni neither does yours, so it's it's you know it's uh, it's managing the payment system, you know, for the Federal Reserve and managing the you know the distribution of, of U.S. currency and coin domestically and around the world. Now, having said that, in my prior roles, I have actually have the had the opportunity to attend uh, federal, federal Open Market Committee meetings, the FOMC. Um, and I can tell you from having attended those meetings, and you can validate this because we publish verbatim word for word transcripts of you know, meetings after a certain period of time, <clears throat> politics never comes up. I mean, when, when uh, policymakers walk into that room, they're really focused on what is the right best answer for the economy at this period of time. There are people in that room um, that were appointed by different presidents that have different political views. They might disagree significantly on political matters, but when it comes to the economy, they come together to try to make the best right decision for the economy. So in, in some respects, you can think of the Federal Reserve or central banks generally, uh, but you can think of the Federal Reserve as you know attempting to be a bit of a shock absorber, um, you know, to the to the financial institution or to the financial system rather, um, and uh, and politics just doesn't come into those uh, to those conversations. Yeah, it's that's this, this uh, that's my impression in Europe as well. Um, political independence does not mean that central banks are not political but there are no politicians giving us a call That's right. and telling us what we have to do. 
whether we have to raise the interest rates or to lower them down or do anything like that. I, as you know, Kara, I was long in politics, but since the time I'm a member of the board of, uh, of the German Central Bank, nobody gave me a call and, uh, and, and said, you honestly have to do it that or that way. On the other hand, of course, we know that what we do has a political dimension. That was what Helmut Kohl always said. Helmut Kohl said, and he was one of the father of the euros. He said, the euro is not only a currency. It's not only an economical uh, matter of fact. It's in a certain way, the question of peace in Europe, um, because the euro is a political project. And that's what we are always aware of. So a couple of years ago, when we looked over to Greece, um, well, maybe it was not the best decision that the central banks were going to organize the rescue. Maybe direct um, transformation uh, via states or or uh, or taxpayers' money would have been more affected. I, I don't know, but I think it's important that from time to time we have to be aware that we are political persons. But and now I'm back to Mark. When we sit together and when we discuss all this. We look into our Deutsche Bundesbank Gesetz, into the Deutsche Bundesbank Act, and then we are looking about financial stability, and then we are talking about financial stability. And when the ECB, uh, when they come together, the question always from Christine Lagarde is, is it data driven? Is our decision data driven? So there are a lot of, of economists, economists working for the Deutsche Bundesbank. Um, and they are, have different models and cases and all those things. And these, this is the basis that we make our decisions on. But I cannot remember in the last eight years that there was one decision that we only did because there was a political opinion or there were different political classes in, in the board. I cannot remember. <clears throat> Uh, thank you. As a numismatist, I'd like to come to a numismatic question. I hope you don't mind. Oh. And this is the US penny, but this might be true also for the euro cent. In fact, if you go in that room, you see the original design by Victor Brenner, and it's probably the only coin um, that we still use exactly like that since the beginning of the 20th century. It costs now 2.1 cent to make this, and um, it's the largest it's in the 40 plus percent of whatever, you know the numbers better, I'm sure, than I do. You're doing great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, when I was the uh, head of the Citizens Coinage Advisory Committee, I once foolishly made a comment that Pelly needs to be abolished and there needs to be another way of um, basically helping from what my understanding is, you know, the, let's say the, the population that supposedly use it when you walk uptown you can see this is the population that often throws that penny away and my real question here is is the inherent conservatism of uh, u.s coinage in particular i think eventually has to become a problem when it becomes more and more expensive to produce that and is there not from particular the federal reserve bank maybe something that in particular the uh, psychology of people using it and that seem to be defending it that needs to be addressed in the long term and I see absolutely nothing done on that front isn't that and I hope I'm not too aggressive here but it's one of my little pet peeves that I have that I just don't understand uh, why this coin still exists well, I'm, I'm tempted to say penny for your thoughts. Uh, because uh, <laughs> no, I have lots of yeah, them. But, but I think I already heard them. So um, let me let, let me I'll say a couple of things and I'll again emphasize these are my views. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of my I'll, I'll give you both some you know clear facts and also a little bit of my own opinion. Um, so the clear facts uh, in nowhere in our mandate in the Federal Reserve is it's is it said um, that it's up to us what coins uh, get minted, what denominations are circulated, what get, gets minted, uh, and, what's, uh, and what gets designed and, and uh, produced. 
Um, that's, a, that's a political decision, as we just answered. We're not a political organization in the sense mm -hmm. that, that uh, you know, we're a very independent central bank. So in the United States, and every country is a little bit different, but in the United States, uh, decisions about, uh, about what coins are produced, what denominations are produced, and what denominations are circulated, um, those decisions are made by Congress. Um, and they direct the mint to do certain things. And so uh, my best advice to people who have opinions about uh, what coin denominations should be uh, designed, produced, and distributed and circulated, my best advice is um, to talk to your congressperson because those are the people uh, ultimately that have decision rights over uh, over what uh, over U.S. coinage. Um, now. Our, our role is circulating and meeting demand for US coin. And, um, and, and that job has been very challenging over the past uh, few years, because as transactional use of cash has gone down, that means circulatory patterns for coin um, have, have changed also. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's remarkable how quickly society has changed in this regard, in the sense that if you were to go back in time just five years ago, we would be using coins for parking meters, for transit, for vending machines, um, just for all yeah. types of things that don't take coin. I mean, we use credit cards or other other things uh, like that for all of those things today, uh, or our phone uh, for all of those things. And so um, coin circulation remains a challenge. One possible way to address that challenge could be um, minting fewer denominations and focusing on those higher value uh, denominations. But again, that's a, that's, a, that's a decision that's not up to the Federal Reserve. It's, uh, it's a, a political one. Having attempted exactly the Congress route, um, because there was actually a surprising number of members of um, Congress. I once had to speak on coin design to the Senate Banking Committee, and it turned out Sarbanes and all these people were coin collectors. Um, so they were interested in these issues. But I think that there's so little knowledge generally about this, and that people, even when you talk to them and say, this is what it costs, even to members of Congress, that seems to come as a surprise. Hence, is it not perhaps does this need to be maybe through the Federal Reserve Bank at least the cost, and this is after all probably to the taxpayer in some shape or form, should that not be more um, made clear to the public maybe and then it would go through somewhere? Yeah, you know, this is a, it's, it's a, it's a good, it's a good point and a good question. I, I might just go back to one of Johannes's uh, points then and say that, you know, when it comes to making policy at the central bank, you know, we try to do so without political influence. And so when it comes to setting laws, um, I think it, it would be only fair of people in Congress to uh, expect the same uh, the same reciprocal um, uh, benefit uh, that maybe the central bank doesn't tell it what it what it should do. Um, I will tell you that, you know, we have tried to tackle this issue from a, a, the place where we where we can uh, try to influence demand for the penny. So we've convened, for example, groups of retailers and um, and financial institutions to suggest perhaps uh, maybe rounding might be an opportunity to to reduce the demand for pennies. So if pennies are still in circulation, that's fine. But but if retailers aren't using them and they're not ordering them, then financial institutions aren't ordering them. And perhaps we can bend the demand curve um, for pennies so we can tackle it from that perspective. Um, I will tell you that that hasn't gained an awful lot of traction in the United States because um, retailers are concerned that you know customers will think they've raised the price or something you know, to, in order to round the price down. Um, so, so this is a, uh, I, an absolutely challenging issue um, you know with uh, with no clear resolution in sight we i, I know uh, mark has a plane to catch pretty soon so we we sort of running short of time but we the session is as well uh, streamed live to our membership they are there have been a range of questions as well uh -huh. i'll read i summarize three of them so mm -hmm. maybe we can maybe tackle yeah. them together or put yeah. them together so one question was, um, cash is legal tender. So what can we do when we tell and refuse cash? Can we, is there like a, can we legally force them uh, to accept cash? Another question was, are we having a shortage of uh, US 
coinage or I guess banknotes or cash in the US economy? Is this something you're seeing? And another member is like, um, and it, it links to what you just said, um, there used to be larger denominations in the US, in the Eurozone, there used to be 500 euros, no, it's 200. The Swiss have a 1,000 francs um, banknote. So how about reintroducing higher denomination, unless we are afraid they could, you know, open up to fraud, terrorism, and also, you know, also kind of risk. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of, kind of three questions uh, in one. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, well, so uh, I think you answered your third question in your in your okay. asking of yeah, it. Okay. Uh, that uh, there are some good reasons why higher denominations. Uh, you know, I, I think that's unlikely, um, uh, just because you know what currency is really used for its transactions and store of value. And when I talk store of value, I don't mean you know very very large stores of value. I'm thinking about household store of value. Um, on coin, um, we have a circulation issue in the United States that we're really grappling uh, with. We've convened uh, and formed a U.S. coin task force. They recently just issued a paper, which you can find online. Happy to give you a link to um, trying to work through solutions um, to, to get the circulation system running once again. Um, as I mentioned, it's challenging because all of the places where all of us just once readily used coin, a lot of those places don't exist anymore. And so coin is settling in various places, including the empty peanut butter jar in your laundry room where you put all your coin when you come uh, home uh, from work or from school or, or whatever. Um, and we need to get that coin moving. So if you go on Twitter or you go on LinkedIn, you'll see get coin moving, uh, you know, as a hashtag trying to get people to, uh, to empty out those, uh, those jars in their laundry room. So please do that. Um, and I'm now I'm forgetting your third question. It was about the, the legal terms oh, of, yeah. of cash. Yeah, I mean, so, um, you know, the, there are various laws around the United States that, that require retailers to either accept all means of payment. Um, there are other parts of the United States that allow retailers to choose. Um, some places offer a discount for cash. Some places charge a premium for card. Um, so uh, the, the rules around that are really set, you know, state by state, city by city, you know, around the, around the country. And then chime in on those three. It's, it's, it's similar in, in Europe, cash is the only legal tender because you have to have one legal tender at the end of the day, which the people base on. And if they do not uh, refer to other means of payments, then it is cash. So I'm not talking about anything else because uh, money is a public good and the public good means it's cash, what the public good is. Um, and all the other questions you address are in Europe similar. So we had the payment, we had the discussion about the one cent coins as well, a couple of years ago. I remember very well because the now Chancellor Scholz was Minister of Finance and we had a short discussion about that. Um, and then we said, all right, as long as the prices are 198, 199, we need all the small denominations as well. And it is expensive to mint them. I know it very well, but on the other hand, at the moment, you know, we are putting, um, or in, in Germany, we try to, to lower the price of gas. Originally, it's even more expensive than uh, the minting of, of pennies or cents. And so we have, that's interesting, we have all over the world, all the same mm. discussions and uh, similar results. <laughs> Do we have time for for a last question? Sure. So you need yeah. to no. no. One more. It's always dangerous, by the way. I've learned this from speaking in front of many crowds. It's always the last question that gets you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, if everything is getting digitalized, um, if everything is getting digitalized, I don't think it will push back away cash. If if you look at music. When I grew up and you wanted to listen to music, you had to go to a store and buy a physical medium. Today, you can use Spotify, whatever you want, and listen to it in digital form. But if it's a very nice band, if it's a very nice album, you still go to the store and buy it. So will the digitalization maybe give us an opportunity to reshape cash so that it competes with what we can see in the vault of the ANS here? 
and maybe transform it into something which is as beautiful as the old coins have been a long time ago. So very philosophical question for the end. You know, I carry a $2 bill with me everywhere I go um, because it just reminds me of the artistic value of, of currency. And I don't know um, that a digital dollar or a digital euro, I mean, it will, it will have its own, you know, beauty, I, I think, associated with it. But when you think about banknotes, this, this, this device, and it's really a device, it's, it's, a, it's a mix of technology and of art and of science and history. And, you know, for people who appreciate, um, you know, the, the, just the, the, the structure, the design and the, uh, and the history behind banknotes, I feel like I'm in such a place right now. Um, uh, you know, it, it's very difficult for me to imagine a digital version of this you know, fulfilling all of those, you know, those very tangible and, and visible um, qualities. Now, having said that, um, you know, I went to a conference this summer um, that was celebrating everything about the decentralized future, the D, you know, DeFi, Web3, digital assets, etc. And there's no way to spend a $2 bill in the metaverse. And so the question <laughs> is, if that is the direction that the world is going, certainly there's going to be an, a, a need for a means of commerce within it. Um, it's probably not going to be this, um, but at least for, you know, for some uh, some uh, uh, part of our future history, I suspect people will still um, uh, demand uh, this because uh, it's both a means of payment, it's a store of value, and it's also a little slice of history, you know, for for many uh, for many people in many countries around the world. Yeah, that's well, well, what I started with, Julia Pitters, um, the psychologist, and um, when she said that uh, it means, uh, you know going to fly around in our heads and making us happy when we handle cash and there's nothing comparable. I, I think I meant the question the other way around. Okay. If, if, if everything is digitalized, yeah. if the book didn't disappear because of the internet. That's right. And the nice music albums which I buy in the store didn't disappear because of Spotify. But I'll just have very nice books. So will the digitalization maybe give us a chance to reshape our cash in a more beautiful way? Because we don't need it for all the vendors and all the vending machines. We just have it because we use it sometimes, but not as often as in the past. So yeah. that maybe the electricity value of it can even be increased. Yeah. So we're working on the next series of US banknotes right now. And I will tell you our overall design priority is security that is it's always going to be everything else is secondary to security um but uh but everything else also also matters and you can uh th this is the 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 beauty and the science behind designing banknotes is you can uh you can incorporate beauty as a security feature also they're not mutually exclusive that's crazy I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, I was just following up with what are the new bills coming out? <laughs> <laughs> we'll save that for the next session. How about that? <laughs> so we may um, close that session. Um, I'd like a round of applause for our speakers. Um, a few announcements. And first of all, we uh, as part of a launch of a book. I believe the books are um, offered uh, to the audience, but maybe they could be autographed. Oh, I don't know. Um, That's why we are sitting here. <laughs> another announcement um, many of you are not members of VNS. You're welcome to join. Uh, there are several staff of VNS around, so feel free to uh, give us you know, your email or something and we will welcome you. We publish journals and we're doing a hybrid and in person and online events, so you will not be disappointed. Um, I'd like to thank as well the people behind everything. Um, so we, we had uh, Alan Roche and uh, Ben Ibner uh, making this technologically possible, and uh, our curator, um, uh, Jesse, uh, Jesse Kraft, who could open the vault and uh, offer us a, a tour of the vault and help people uh, across this uh, uh, sacred space.
Thank you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication, and events, you can support the Society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below.